welcome all of you uh, who are coming into this space to our book launch celebration for Carolina Hachindani and her new Perugia Press book, The Book Eaters, which is also her first published collection. I'm Rebecca Olander. I'm the editor and director of Perugia Press. We publish just one book a year here at the press, and that book is by an emerging woman poet, and Carolina's book is our 27th collection. So we've been doing this one book a year, um, one year at a time since 1997. We are so pleased to gather with everyone who's listening in to mark the arrival of this important and beautiful book. I'm gonna give you a little description of the book um, to start, and then I'll let you know how the evening's going to go. And we have Carolina reading as well as three special guest poets. So you're, you're in for a wonderful night. In Carolina Hachindani's debut, The Book Eaters, the poet's desire for agency over her life's narrative is counterbalanced by her awareness that poetry is written precisely when life wrests control from us. This book, conceived in loss, examines shifts in identity due to partition, immigration, illness, and birth. As roles evolve and dissolve, the poet witnesses the decay of language, artifacts, and history, yet these erasures are also generative. They beget poetic creation. The Book Eaters is a study in belonging as well to our bodies, our memories, our stories, ourselves, our families, our cultures. Hachindani's poems interrogate what it means to be full or empty of words, of the past, of another human being. They illuminate our inextricability from our creaturehood. Even as they explore unraveling through the metaphor of insects that devour the very pages we produce, these poems are tightly woven into exquisitely crafted, into an exquisitely crafted cohesive collection. Our evening together will be a reading shared between poet Carolina Hachindani and special guests Jennifer K. Sweeney and Lynn Thompson, who are both also Perugia poets, as well as Catherine Barnett, who wrote in praise of Carolina's book, which can be found on its back cover. I'll introduce each guest reader before they read for 15 minutes, approximately up to 15. And we'll hear original work from them, as well as a poem they've each chosen from the Book Eaters, one of their favorite poems. And finally, I'll introduce Carolina and we'll hear her read from the Book Eaters for about 20 minutes, up to 20 minutes. And the remainder of the evening is set aside for your questions and comments for the poets to talk to each other. Uh, so please add questions that you have. There's a Q&A um, in the strip on the bottom. Some of you already found it uh, to let me know about the chat. So as questions occur to you, if you wanna put them there, put them in the chat. Um, that would be wonderful. And if you're so moved as you're listening to reading and, and you want to make comments in the chat, that's always really nice to see as well. Um, even just a thank you at, at the end and, and poets will feel like you're, you're out there and, and hearing, hearing their work. Um, and it's also just nice to see who's in the Zoom room together. So our program will run for an hour and 30 minutes um, at the outside. And we don't see you, as I said before, but we feel you and very much appreciate your presence with us. Um, the chat button is at the bottom, so use that uh, liberally. And my co-host is Perugia board member Beverly Army Williams. Um, she will be adding bios and links um, to in the chat, links to poets' websites and places you can read more about them, as well as where to buy their books. So I do, with my publisher's hat on, I want to remind you that the best way to support writers, as well as the small presses that publish them, is to buy their books and books make great gifts. So you might already have some of these books, but maybe they're a favorite collection and you wanna pass them on to um, someone else so they can enjoy the book as well. And I wanna let you know that tonight, purchases of the Book Eaters will be shipped to you with a book plate signed by Carolina. So, you know, the way you would get a book signed if we were together with you in person. All right, I'm ready to move on to our first reader. Um, we have Jennifer K. Sweeney kicking off the evening. Jennifer K. Sweeney is the author of four poetry collections, Fox Logic Fireweed from Backwaters Press and the University of Nebraska, 
Little Spells, How to Live on Bread and Music, which was her Perugia book. And that also received the James Laughlin Award, the Perugia Press Prize, and a nomination for the Poets Prize, and Salt Memory. The collaborative chapbook, Dear Question, with Perugia Pressmate L.I. Henley will be published in 2024 from Glass Liar Press. Congratulations, L.I. and Jennifer. The recipient of a Pushcart Prize, her poems have appeared widely in journals and appear most recently in Birdcoat Quarterly, Guest House, for which she just got a best of the net nod, One Art, Orion, Poetry Northwest, Sixth Finch, Terrain, The Shore, and Waxwing. I give you Jennifer K. Sweeney. Thank you so much, um, Becky. I am um, here in Southern California and I was in like the right spot and then like this, the light changed rapidly. So I'm a bit of glow, but um, really that's um, because I'm so excited to be here and to be celebrating um, Carolina's The Book Eaters. So for my reading tonight, I would really like to start with a poem of hers. So I'm just gonna hold up her beautiful book um, Perugia makes gorgeous books to look at, and Carolina's is, um, is definitely um, stunning. So I'll just kind of show it to you. The one that I chose to read, and, um, and I had a hard time choosing just one, was um, called A Bird in the Hand, or A Bird in the Mind, sorry. A Bird in the Mind, and this is by Carolina. The trees, the redwoods, waving, skimmed her thought of the trees, the way the wind grazed the canopy of the forest. Some trunks creaked as her mind fell quiet, heightening to the falling capacity of trees that stand at such a height. Her mind tree leaned till it fell, and her mind ear leaned till it heard the sound the tree might make if it tipped if it brushed the other tree's leaves, and then branches, and then whatever ground would catch it when it toppled, cutting a hole in the mind forest's top. Light flooded the space. She was happy. Death had hollowed her out, making spaces within her as the redwoods had, which animals entered and filled with themselves. Some were clawed and by digging made the hollows wider. Some had wings that flapped and tickled her as they flew up until they'd gotten a bird's eye view of the uppermost layer of that forest. They were higher than the woman was and higher than the tree had been, free enough to flee her and free enough within to stay within. Thank you so much for writing that beautiful poem. It's a pleasure to read it. Um, I thought that I would pick um, one poem to read from my Perugia book, How to Live on Bread and Music. And um, I wanted to select a poem uh, that felt like maybe it would be a friend to a bird in the mind. And this is the one that I chose. In some forests. In some forests, it is always dark. And so night is a matter of perception dark as when a door is about to close, but does not, and a careful emptiness is allowed. Indifference deafens, questions can be left behind. The Zen eyes of the eagle care nothing for this moment, as if seeing were a little theft. Come, come beckons the skipper of the heart, who isn't waiting to be filled by any creek shade or mock sun, by the inky green that is greener in here, scrubbed and newly made. Every year a tree creates absolutely from scratch, 99% of its living parts. Oh, brittle dead wood, oh, bones. And for the rest of my reading, I think I'm just going to choose um, about six poems that are not collected in a book that are in manuscripts, books to be, I hope. Um, and kind of staying with that um, tree theme, 
but also weaving in a little bit of the father theme that's so prevalent in Carolina's book. Um, I wanted to read this one called Willow. Willow. When it has been a year since I've seen my father and my sense of the flesh of him is a thin fade, I play back his messages on the machine. I have saved them over the years like a nesting box of voices from his previous selves. His soft greeting softens papery first, then like cloth. I can hear the way it cottons over time until his words are willow leaves bending in the wind, such fine hairs. And I think this is how angels must talk. His voice is becoming strands of light skimming across the country to tell me about the tree that fell in the night and landed inches from the house. To tell me to be careful, go slow, slower than I think slow is. When I drove off so far away in my car 25 years ago, I didn't know what I was giving up, but here I've been ever since, carrying this machine from place to place. Um, this next one was uh, recently printed in a journal that I really like called The Shore. Um, the poem is called The Little Deaths. The Little Deaths. The ghosts are all day with us, not cartoon roundnesses or bitter haunts, but the stirring upon surfaces as things let go. Bellied mouse and husked grasses, tumbleweed orbs I bundle in late fall whirl of the coyote eye as it passes. We are strangers in our passing, but born out of a brushed wood I gazed into moments ago and saw nothing. And from that, the eye amended the vacancy. And I thought I'd seen it before, so familiar as around the old table, Rose's eye or Teddy's eye. The poem puts on its grief jacket to write the poems about death before death has a shadow, rehearsal when there is not yet a play. I pull the little deaths close to me. They are my deaths. They breathe and lean in like a group of children once did when I swayed above them reading a book. The story is short and when it is over, they leave and do not close the door. I've been writing um, poems that kind of speak from aspects of nature. And um, this next one is a tree that uh, grows here in California that's got a very spiky yellow kind of protective covering. It's the golden chinkapin. So, golden chinkapin. Then turn in the sky tumble of a full crown, then thickly sway in slow pawing notes, slat light and the low doze of fruit, chocolate brown and night shined inside the inside of pith and husk and pin, needle them so, then golden in October's druze, chink, from chinku, from chinkwa, from big, large, great, great body lined, bright red beneath dark loaves of trunk, then sweeten, pods crack at the hinge, night shined, pin from men, from seed, from me. trees continue to stay with us. Um, before I was a, a dancer, or before I was a poet, I was a dancer, um, but I never wrote any poems about it until like six months ago. And now I've just been writing so many poems about this time in my life that I guess needed to sit dormant for quite a long time. So um, I have a few dance poems um, that will sort of close this, this reading. This is called Martha Graham as Apple Orchard. And um, I guess it's a poem that was written in the wake of sort of the failing ballet um, being of my, of my life. Martha Graham as Apple Orchard. What to do with all this feeling? 
was the crux of my loneliness. 20, filled with necessity, but limitations of technique, the studio mirror performed my flaws daily. All this feeling, so giant the question. I took it on walks most afternoons after rehearsal to the Dairy Queen, the Gorge, beyond brick neighborhoods lined with elaborate fences, past the nursing home, a monastery. Where after walking the stations of the cross led to a private orchard, early fall, the grove, a theater more home than any stage. I saw you in each apple tree, lithe choreography of contraction and release, your exquisite torso curving off center just before it falls, then surging open to the sky. Tried on your suspended shapes, danced with you in the crinkled hues, where to take such feeling. Outside dark meadow, take it to the woods, the sea, the desert, the gravity pull of earth. Do not cave in. The contraction is a movement into something. I was your student briefly before the snows came. You swayed across the grasses and I leapt, following each trunk's swiveling frame. Like notes to a dance, you left your fever chart in the trees. Pulse, spiral, release, tilt. I exchanged the sequence over and over to find different ways to open and fall, to fall open, blood and movement, somewhere finally to take the dirge of openness, the bottomless falling, what quickens to the instant. When the sun sunk, I climbed up and nestled in your deepest contraction, the branches of your body made a small house theater, word that was first verb before noun, an act and then a place. You must make the gesture. If I wouldn't be a studio dancer, a stage dancer, taking my bow, I was this other, not held in an eight count, but receiver, the way I would let the world move through me. And I think I'll close with this one because I'm really anxious to hear Carolina. This is called, um, We Could Be Dancing Already. We could be dancing already, each of us a body in a field of air, canvas like absorbing our postures, subway riders tilted with the shapes of departure, surgeons parting the swinging doors, every person managing the weight of their gear. Those who tend the pain body and must never stop listening. Those who have found themselves swimming in heavy weathers. The fraught decisions, the unrequited, a dance of faults and fractures, of planes sliding over each other and sliding apart. A dance of darkening to nearly night and becoming progressively lighter upward or when the floor suddenly releases its trap. To move in the ordinary ways, the raised hand bending towards shoes, love in idleness on knees, planting or praying, balancing a child upon hip for years as a practice that sways the weight left to free the right more capable. We meet each other in the familiar forms adjusted by degrees. Each of us tangoing our matter as self and cargo, as actor and shelter and natural history, laying it down, raising it up in a field of air that you and you press into, worry into, slide into, collapse into, received. Baby body nestled into youth, into sexual body. Upon decades, we become the strata of our former selves. Moving a field in the air, we make warmer through it with our persistent tumbling, born into it, slow dancing out. Oh, Jennifer, that was beautiful. Um, just 
beautiful, really lovely to hear new work. What a gift. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want folks who are, who can see the panelists to know that um, from the audience side, it's, it's definitely set up so that the audience is seeing the speaker. Um, so just so you know, and I believe that's, um, correct me if I'm wrong in the chat audience, but I believe that we're just, um, listeners are, are seeing just the, the person who's speaking and reading. Um, and I'm going to try to remember to change it to gallery so that when we have a conversation at the end, we can see everybody um, who's in the, in the room. Um, planting and praying and a practice. Um, that just feels so apt for, for what we're doing share with poetry. Um, yeah, and it, was it a tangle of cargo? So, a tango, a tango because of the dance, of course. Beautiful. Um, all right, I love how your work is speaking to, um, how the work is speaking to each other already. Having only knowing, um, even though that, that's new work, knowing Carolina's book and having spent so much time with it and, and hearing your work, Jennifer. So our next reader is Lynn Thompson. Uh, Lynn Thompson was the Los Angeles 2021 to 2022 Poet Laureate, and she is a Poet Laureate Fellow of the Academy of American Poets. She is the author of three collections of poetry, including Beg No Pardon, which is her Perugia book, and Fretwork, which was the winner of the 2019 Marsh Hawk Poetry Prize chosen by Jane Hirschfield. Her fourth collection, very excited about this, Blue on a Blue Palette, will be published by BOA Editions next spring, spring of 2024. Congratulations, Lynn. Her recent work can be found or is forthcoming in Best American Poetry, Kenyan Review, Massachusetts Review, The Slowdown, and the anthology, I believe this is from uh, Black Lawrence, maybe, um, In the Tempered Dark, Contemporary Poets Transcending Elegy. Thompson sits on the boards of the Los Angeles Review of Books, Cave Canem, and the Poetry Foundation, which is a new appointment. Congratulations on that. I give you Lynn Thompson. Thank you so much, Becky. It's such a delight to be here and to help Carolina launch this fantastic book. I'm thrilled for you and thrilled to welcome you into the family. Um, I too wanted to start with one of your poems, one of your beautiful poems, and also found it difficult to select just one, but I did. And that one is entitled Sequel. Picture books are for babies, my daughter declares, pulling from her shelf the green caterpillar, the blue jacketed bear. I try to follow along, honor this phase. In stacks, in boxes, the books lie for days. A golden lion, king of one stack, smiles under a bubble that says, roar! What's a roar without that sunny head? I live in rows of black words, white pages. Once, my daughter squealed at the black and white misbehaving spotted dog who tramples rows of flowers and is loved. In stacks, in boxes, the books lie for days. Here, a marigold's face can grow a mane, a lion can bloom, a childhood can end, begin again. I just love that so much, so, so much. And I was trying to think, are any of my poems in conversation with, with any of, of these poems? And that's why I selected this because it was in conversation with Purgatorio, which is from my, from my Perugia book, Beg No Pardon. Purgatorio. Once there was a girl who ate paper, but not just any paper, no Macy's receipts or mattress tags, no. She preferred Proust for breakfast, a little Tolstoy on toast. During school recesses, she was seen gnawing on the weary blues. Always bored by just one thing, she devoted the seasons to variety. Shakespeare in spring, of course, and always, always Pushkin in December 
every other year. Every other year, she left luck to chance. The ho in 92, the holidays were all James's, Henry, Joyce, and Baldwin. The family was a little put out by it. Her rumps and tongues clacking were heard across the dinner table. In photos, her image looked a little like the color purple's Sealy. All she knew was that everything on earth was a bristle. One year, she disappeared altogether. There's even a tale tall in the telling we're sure that when she finally took a merchant for a lover, she hid sonnets to Orpheus beneath his pillow, which he tolerated until he found death of a salesman atop the john and fled. Recently, she was spotted in serene repose on a California beach, a tattered copy of the myth of Sisyphus clutched between her teeth. So those are our, our conversations going on, Carolina. And um, those who've heard me read know that I always like to give homage to the ancestors for, in this one, particularly to my father, who is an immigrant to America from the West Indies. Emma Gray, maybe it was reflex. Maybe it was memory and want. Want for the scent of sour sop and sugar apples. Memory of the flight of a frigate bird that made us drive every Sunday down Vine Street past Forest Lawn Cemetery to Griffith Park where daddy, nutmeg colored and clad head to toe in his all whites, came to play cricket and make believe he was home in Bucamont Valley, St. Vincent, West Indies, where he could be the man home would have made of him. Although none of that meant one EC dollar to me because in those days, cricket with its ball of string and hard cork, wooden stumps, and willow carved blades turned into bats was an odd British formality. A long ago when ladies wore pale hose and organdy hats and I was allowed to wear my Sunday finery as long as I didn't stain my not for school skirt. Drink tea in royal crown cups and wolf down cucumber and cream cheese sandwiches those old world women made for their men to devour during the break in the game, which might last for a leisurely hour or more before the teens would take up again in a throw of fear because daddy was the game's best bowler and with his elbow cocked and a lightning rotation of his arm he threw googlies leg breaks and flippers always got his man and took the wicket because daddy could bring the heat although he never would have said bring the heat because his home rule kind of schooling favored the king's english over the colloquial but it was exactly this heat bringing and resplendent use of language that made him the kind of man to be reckoned with. And I worked hard to grasp it. So that's for my daddy smiling somewhere. She's a poet. <laughs> and then I just wanted to read a few poems from my upcoming collection. As Becky said, it's blue on a blue palette and I'm very excited about it. I hope you all will be too. This first poem I'm gonna read is an absidarian, which only means for those of you who aren't poets on this webinar, that each line begins with a successive letter of the alphabet. So it's a 26 line poem. This is particularly for my Perugia sisters who are on the call. A confluence of women. And always the sense we've assembled ourselves as barmaids or burdens of proof courtesans or drama in the style of all's well that ends, as long as it doesn't end in fine print. You might suspect us, ordinary as gabardine, and of course, you're right, hell-bent as we are and irked at our own recidivism. We Jezebels on the loose, both kinophobes and kerosene, but lastly, or mostly so, 
we are fearless, like to mosey with a fret of fierce sisters who've been nearly always misunderstood, or worse, understood as reclining on palanquins for others' pleasure, when, in our quiescent moments, we enjoy that leisure as our own right to self-centered satisfaction, the right to our own temerity. Even a carpetbagger can't sneer at any undertaking we women might fashion for ourselves, vigorous as we are, quick to whistle while drowning, but not to worry. We're xerophytic and not so easily lost as a yacht, its tiny flags flailing, the sea the color of zirconium or some other form of divination. Variations on Lines by Linda Gregerson. Like the woman so fallen out of practice, she can no longer. And the important point here is practice. For a woman without practice cannot unbuckle, forsake the grim or shake the shadows. Or maybe the point is can no longer, as in can no longer be a pigeon, a snare with no place in the band. To be like a woman is to be becoming, ever spun around, the motto on an unguided path, open-throated, fever, and a release. Thank you, Linda Gregerson. And this poem is a cento, which I'm very fond of, of writing. In this case, it combines lines from the poets, Terence Hayes and um, Diane Seuss, who I think many of us will agree are our most amazing American sonneteers. The title, frankly, when asked about the autonomy of my body, I consider my inner assassin for inside me is a black-eyed animal, the umbilicus from which everything originates. I have no origin story. Unburdened by conscience, like a baby, the umbilicus from which everything originates. I wonder if Jesus wants souls like the devil does, unburdened by conscience, like a baby the list of pallbearers still in a drawer somewhere. I bet you shapeshifters want souls like devils do, their hinges turning, the list of pallbearers still in a drawer somewhere, an existential jambalaya, their hinges turning, a clamor of voltas or some existential jambalaya. My only fear, fear of a virtuous mob a clamor of voltas shaped like a silver tongue. My deepest fear, a virtuous mob of mother wit and mother woe. Shaped like a silver tongue, I have no origin story of mother wit and mother woe. Inside me is a black eyed animal. The title of this poem, Boketo, is a Japanese term the meaning of which will become clear in the poem. I wrote this poem for Sandra Bland. Boketo. I won't stop. Even if a cop appears from perdition in a place he has no reason to be. Even if he slams me against the sidewalk or with the butt of his gun and tells me I am under arrest, but not why. Even if he looks both gleeful and hateful as he asks to see my ID then throws me into no one will ever find her here. Even if he drags me along the ground until my flesh becomes gravel road then tosses me into the back seat of a black and white then delivers me to a sergeant who orders a mugshot that will make me look wasted. I am not wasted. And even if after days of being forgotten in a jail cell smelling of piss and vomit, my bladder full of fear, 
I am taken before someone who someone says has the right to judge me, who asks, how do you plead? I will concede that I am only guilty of practicing boketto, the Japanese art of gazing into the distance with no thought of anything specific while Black. And I'll close with this poem, which is a glossa. Thank you, Eleanor Wilner. I learned this form from her. The poem begins with an epigraph that will be repeated in the body of it. Allow yourself to be spelled differently. It will feel like falling. It has waiting attached. Emma Melton. Blue Muscle. Allow yourself everything, especially those things you have stored on a shelf saying, that's not for me, or I am not able. Flesh out your serpent and your water lily. They are similar. They're the floor and steeple of that self you never imagined existed. Take a chance to stand in a shower of your personalities. It's okay for your name to be spelled differently so that when you are called, you are called agate by those who know you, tapestry, or by those who are unsure, blue muscle, because they hope you are something more than you've seemed, something more than just indubitably, clairvoyant, perhaps, or something like a body of such pure and utter release or such unfettered gladness, it will feel like falling. As though the mere assignment of a new name is a drawstring pulling you through the grief buried deep inside you. Could be the planetary shift that turns one woman into hardware, but turns you into a cello's bowstring. It's as simple as child's play. So recherche, with a design so singular, it has waiting attached. An intermission that frustrates then propels you to scratch to blood the itch, that irrefutable hanker, to be named and renamed. That desire to be known as seed or thirst or winter weather. Cool, but hardly detached, or unwilling, the impulse that gives you permission to swim with a seahorse, to admit the joy in your life is labyrinth. Thank you. Oh, I have chills. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, we have ancestors in the space and fearless sisters and um, the mo mother wit and mother woe, or wrestling with whether one has mother wit and mother woe, um, and naming that place, naming the the place where no one will ever find her. Um, that was so powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and I hope we can talk about form, maybe. But <laughs> if, if we don't get to it, we'll we'll have to have a conversation sometime. Sure. Um, Thank you. Our third reader is Catherine Barnett. So excited that you're you're here with us um, tonight to join our Perugia circle. Catherine Barnett is the author of three poetry collections, Human Hours from Grey Wolf. It's the winner of the Believer Book Award for Poetry and was a finalist for the Four Quartets Prize. The Game of Boxes, also from Grey Wolf. And into perfect spheres, such holes are pierced from Alice James. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a 2022 award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She is a clinical professor in the creative writing program at NYU and lives in New York City, where she is also teaching privately and works as an independent editor. Lucky people who get to work with you, Catherine. Her fourth book of poems, congratulations. It's called Solutions for the Problem of, Problem of Bodies in Space. And that will be published also by Grey Wolf, Lucky Grey Wolf, Lucky Us in May of 2024. I give you Catherine Barnett.
and I will ask you to unmute. You've been so okay. good about Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can't see the audience, but I see my fellow panelists. So that's very warming and those poems were beautiful. I'm very happy to be here with Carolina to celebrate her book, um, which is kind of a, it's a book of transformations and waiting for transformations. And I chose a poem called Self Portrait as a Woman's Intention to Write. Um, uh, when I was working on writing a blurb for the book, I wrote in the margin, longing for things to stay as they are and to be different. So I'll read this poem and then I'll, I'll read a few poems of my own. Self-portrait as a woman's intention to write. Once she gives birth, once the feeding's over, once the baby sleeps, once the crying stops, once the clothes are clean, once the piles are folded, once her, once her old clothes fit, once the mind is clear, once the baby babbles, once intention buds, once fatigue fades, once the new day starts, once her body's hers, once the toddler speaks, once an hour cracks open, once the words surround her, once a poem grips her, once the child's at school, once the woman's cry is louder than the child's. I love that, um, that run of things we wait for. Um, I thought I would read from my second book. I have in that book, a, a sequence of poems called Chorus. I thought this speaks um, because Carolina's book is so much about birth and being a new mother. And in this book, the chorus, I thought of them as children who are 5,000 years old, a group of children who are 5,000 years old and whose adults uh, who are always failing them, but the kids keep being somewhat forgiving and understanding, but they recognize that our failures as mothers. And I, I don't know if it will give you hope or fear, but anyway, I thought it was a kind of uh, a, a companion to, to your to issues brought up in your poems. So I'm just gonna read about um, six, they're short, and then I'll read one poem from Human Hours, sorry. <laughs> Okay, and each poem is just called Chorus. Chorus. So imagine that it's a group of children who are 5,000 years old, but they're still children. Chorus. We want to know the reasons for everything, but the mothers tell us, be patient. Hey there, sweetheart, they say. A little fortitude, a little patience. The mothers have beautiful old lady legs. The silence in them spills into us. We are as shh as we can be. Um, chorus. Should we take notes before it's over? We sit beside them waiting. The mothers tell us what's to come that never does come and we mark it down. Or they don't tell us, but we try to remember it. Even when the radiator clangs and the wind blows and the hours disappear, they swear we're fine. They say we're resilient. They march us up the stairs and say we have to laugh about it. Ha ha. We like to laugh. We're still trying to understand the story, the one we're in right now. We thought it would end a little sooner, so we only packed our mouths, the ones with the mouths singing from them. Chorus. Everyone asks what we're afraid of, but we aren't supposed to say. We could put loneliness on the list. We could put this list on the list. It's infinity. We could put infinity down. Who knows why we're here? It's a mystery. We're getting older. And when no one's watching, we climb right into it. Chorus. The mothers keep promising clear skies, but when we look up, it's all clouded over, like a fortune teller's face in the face of the clouds. We turn our own faces to the clouds, so the ones trying to hide from us won't recognize who cries to see them cry. Which way, we say. Onward, the clouds say. 
And this is the last one in the sequence. Chorus. So who mothers the mothers, who tend the hallways of mothers, the spill of mothers, the smell of mothers, who mend the eyes of mothers, the lies of mothers, scared to turn on lights in basements filled with mothers called by mothers in the dark. The kin of mothers, the gin of mothers, mothers out on bail. Who mothers the Hail Mary mothers asleep in their stockings while the crows sing, hey ho, carrion crow. Hold a riddle, lull the riddle, carry on, carry on. And I'll read uh, one poem also related to um, mother daughter issues. My mother was a paint, my mother is a painter. And um, so like Carolina's child, I was raised by uh, someone who was preoccupied by, by making things, um, which for me was a wonderful thing. But anyway, this is um, a poem from Human Hours called In the Studio at End of Day. From my mother, I've inherited dark eyes and the desire to spend hours alone in a room making things that might matter to no one. She paints canvas after canvas. So many, she doesn't know what to do with them all. Would you like one? Please, come down to her studio. She's giving them away now as I write, as I watch her and write and revise draft after draft while not 20 feet from me, she's spilling her paint on the floor. She has more courage than I. Painting's not like writing. You can't get back to earlier versions. Failure is hot right now, said one of the children of her children. And I think my mother was consoled. I was, and then we were in it, celebrating my mother and my father both. She made us laugh as she looked around the table at the mutable world her vast progeny. So many of us, she doesn't know what to do with us all and two already lost. Then she raised a glass to my father and her 90 years together. Who's counting? Time passes while my mother stands before the painting as if it were a mirror and paints the woman's face purple, tilts the woman's head, blurs her outline. She paints with what's at, whatever's at hand chopsticks, fingers, elbow. If she had a gun, she'd use that. My father built the storage racks, but there's no more room. Try to hurry, try to get here fast before she leaves. Last night she went home early and I was by myself in her studio, which is like a womb. Everything pulses. I turned the lights out at the circuit breaker as she taught me. When they go off, they make a kind of bang, a shudder through the walls. Tonight, let's leave my mother working here. She says she's not finished yet. But take a painting on your way out. Tomorrow there will be another. Read this draft. Tomorrow there will be another. Kiss her face. Tomorrow there will be another. Thank you and congratulations to Carolina. Thank you so much, Catherine. I have been in love a long time with how you write about time and it's just really moving. Um, I feel like we are like those children you write about still trying to understand the story we're in, all of us as poets and how we're writing. Um, and I love the way that your the singing spoke to the dancing and Jennifer's um, poems and there's painting and all of these ways of making um, the womb of the studio. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, well, we have the poet of the hour up next. Um, so excited to introduce Carolina Hachandani to you all. Um, it's been a beautiful evening so far. Um, I just want to thank again, everyone who's here. We have um, family and Perugia poets, board members, and readers for the press, um, and, and readers in general, fellow editors, uh, people from all the way from France, one of Carolina's best friends, and, um, and across this country. And it's just um, lovely, lovely to have you here with us. 
Um, I just before I do Carolina's bio, I just want to say what a pleasure and honor it has been to help to birth this book into the world. Um, uh, Carolina did something amazing. She she wrote a book um, in in many ways about her father uh, and um, his decline into dementia. And then after submitting the book, her father passed and she was went was able to go back to that book and keep making it um, in in the wake of his death and it just was an incredible thing to work, walk with you um, through that Carolina um, and uh, to, to watch you keep making your book even after we had accepted what was already so beautiful um, so that was that was something this book changed the most I would say of any book that um, it, it grew the most after it was accepted of any book that that I've had the honor of working with since I since I became the director at Perugia. Um, and to do that in in the face of um, such feeling and to be so um, able able to be so orchestrated with your words on the page was just an amazing feat. So um, brava to you for everything you sent our way and everything you you made um, and brought to the book after we accepted it. Very, very happy it's our latest book. So the bio, Carolina Hachindani is a Latinx South Asian poet born in Brazil and raised in various parts of the United States. She holds degrees from Brown, Texas State and Northwestern universities. Her honors include fellowships from Tin House Writers Workshop, Breadloaf Writers Conference and Napa Valley Writers Conference. Her poetry has appeared in Agni, Alaska Quarterly Review, Beloit Poetry Journal, Blackbird, Cincinnati Review, Prairie Schooner, and other journals. And it kept coming out. That was another thing that was amazing is these poems kept um, coming into the world as the book was coming. So um, we've been celebrating for, for a while now and it's, it's lovely to be here tonight. Carolina is a Goodrich Assistant Professor of English in Omaha, Nebraska where she lives with her husband and daughter. The Book Eaters won the 2023 Perugia Press Prize and it is her debut collection. And I, I know it's just the beginning of what will be a, a beautiful literary career. Can't wait to see what you do next. Very happy to celebrate this book. Um, congratulations, Carolina, on your launch. And I, I give you Carolina Hachindani. Thank you so much. Um, can, you, can you hear me all right? Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Becky, for that introduction and for hosting this event. And before that, um, for selecting the manuscript and for accompanying me and making it the best book that it could be. I feel really honored that my work is in this press's hands. Um, also, thank you to Jennifer, Lynn, and Catherine for reading your moving work and for supporting mine. Um, I've not had that experience before of, of having my own poems um, recited to me, and it feels very strange <laughs> and wonderful and, and really touching. Um, and, and also, I thank all of you for, for being here. I see uh, so many names of participants um, in the webinar people that I haven't, um, you know, been in the same place with for a long time. And it's really wonderful to see you. It just it warms my heart to know that you are, you are there uh, and you're here. Um, so uh, as um, Becky said, um, I started to write the book Eaters um, uh, a while back, it was in 2016. Um, it kept me company as I witnessed various kinds of metamorphoses um the world went through some political shifts uh and we went through a pandemic um and meanwhile personally my daughter was developing from a young toddler to a little girl and at the same time as she was starting to inhabit language and remember her experiences my father's language was becoming less like specific, less precise as his memory was starting to fade. So um, the book registered uh, my grappling with this burgeoning of an identity and the waning of another. 
um, and my trying to make sense of just what it means to be a person, what it means to have an identity at all, um, given that we can change so drastically within this one life of ours. Um, it just, it means a lot to me to be able to share a book that is so personal to me um, with all of you. So um, I will, um, I will start with a poem that's called The Boxes. We move, we move every few years. What's made of glass, we wrap in newspaper, boxing memories that for others live in hometowns. Their memories are perennials, sprouting thoughts of years before, when holes were dug, when kids couldn't decide between irises and alliums. Then the irises won, peddling memories of arguments, reconciliations, purpling that summer. We move in trucks, in boxes, our contents, four continents, and who knows how many cities, rooms, drawers. How many corners of us are emptied in the new town, free of the objects left at the last town's goodwill. We miss the goodwill of old friends. Memories stretch from the last place, the way I reached for an apple at the old grocery store, the whole pyramid of them toppling over, bruised, rolling. Memories of things falling do not exist in neat arrangements on display tables. They do not gleam on the waxed skins of red delicious apples assembled in the same spot in the same store we'd visit for years. We don't have the years. We store the store, our memories rolling to the next town, where some sense of not belonging lives under my hot cheeks as I overhear a girl tell another girl, the eyebrows of the new girl are like the tail of a squirrel. I hear the giggles. I feel the apples bruised rolling through my body, which is no grocery store. The floor of me does not shine. I am not lit with bright lights. I am the boxes we take to the next place, which tear and are taped. When my father starts to forget, I understand. The places never held us. We hold the places. We move. Um, a bit of background on the next poem. Um, it is addressed to my father, who was born in pre-partition India. And um, in 1947, when India's independence was declared, um, we, he, he moved, his family moved southward from what's now Pakistan to what's now India. And it was a traumatic uh, journey. And um, when my brother and I were growing up, we would often be the somewhat unenthusiastic audience members of long lectures on um, history and religion. Um, and so uh, this poem explores that dynamic a bit. Partition. In your version of the story, people butter their fingers with notions of God, splitting India into a smaller India, a new Pakistan. The way a single roti's dough is pulled apart, the new spheres rolled in the palms then flattened. The idea of God, the destroyer of human bonds, you will say. The reason for new borders, new pain to sprout on either side of a dividing line. You'll go on. I'll picture the edges of your words blurring to a hum as I think of how to wrest your rant from you. A rolling pin barrels over dough, widens the soft disk makes it fine. You are fragile, like a story that stretches belief, like a nation, like a thin disc of dough that sticks to a surface, tearing when it's peeled back. I don't know how to part the story from the person and keep the person.
the next poem was um, was written shortly after the election, the presidential election of uh, 2016. Um, and uh, in the first part of the poem, when you hear the words here, here, it's spelled H-E-R-E, H-E-R-E. And then as the poem progresses, you'll hear here, here will be H-E-A-R, H-E-A-R. I think you'll be able to tell when it shifts. Self-portrait as the cornfields. As the past recedes from memory, I retrace my steps. I am a citizen of a former British colony that rebelled from England with a great tea party, declaring itself its motherland, America. Was it orphaned? Did it kill its own mother? Poor England. Where are you from? The other Americans ask me. My mother is Brazilian. My father is Indian. I was born in Brazil but I've been here a long while. Here where? Here, here. Here in New York, Texas, North Carolina, Tennessee, Rhode Island, a year abroad in England, then California, Iowa, Texas again, then a year in South Korea, then Chicago, then another South, but this time South Dakota, which isn't in this country South at all. Now, Nebraska. Here, here where the cornfields stretch from the highway to the horizon. Here, here, where corn is fed to cattle who don't graze. Here, here, as they shout in the House of Commons to affirm the speaker's thoughts. Here, here, to the English that seems foreign. Here, here, to the rustle of corn that doesn't belong here. Here, here, to the language I use to build this block of words, which you may not hear at all. If you are quiet, if you follow the lines with your eyes, unspeaking like mine, as they trace the rows of corn in the fields, fed to the cows that Indians know as holy, fed to the cows the Americans know as beef, I will become your cornfields, striped, farmed, not native at all, but everywhere, everywhere. So the next poem was uh, um, inspired by the avid bird watchers in my father, my, not my father's, <laughs> my husband's family, <laughs> Freud, <laughs> sorry, my, um, yeah, my husband's family. And um, they, uh, as I watch them watch birds, I have thought about just what's my relationship with, with the birds, with identifying birds, with the names of birds. It's called nesting. When the birds' names doubled with words that summoned ideas from their hiding places, the flicker, the chat, the swift, the lark, I watched them more closely, confident that somewhere a thought would escape the bird, alighting upon a pun, and I'd find meaning in a world that glided above me, hardly dipping into my mind. When I saw a swallow's nest balanced on a truss, like an idea teetering upon a word, I waited for the mother swallow to return with her twigs, her morsel of mud, her blade grass. What idea would nestle there? Later, as the babies pecked themselves out of shells, I saw their open beaked pleas, wondered at their desperate mouths and how they swallowed. I believed in no gods, and when words with different meanings echoed themselves, I felt I lived inside a poem someone else had made, and I rhymed with every bird on my line. Memory halved. I remember creating an edible model of a cell when I was 12. My parents helped. We gathered jelly beans, dry noodles, poppy seeds. In a clear round casserole dish, peach jello congealed, turned to cytoplasm. Circus peanuts from last year's Halloween metamorphosed into mitochondria. 
the powerhouse of the cell, my textbook said, as they extract energy from food, deriving from one substance, another. We are always making doubles of what exists, replicas of real things, memories that try to copy experience, even as they tweak the color of a dress, the weather the day of a funeral, and whether we were even there at all. I remember fashioning the nucleus from a hard boiled egg I cut in two. I know, even as my father forgets whole years of my life, that I am more than partly loved. But I recall my shock when he reached for the half of the nucleus I didn't use and took a bite. So the humans reproduced. For the world required another mirror proffered by the eyes of the child. For the ocean was insufficient. For the water on windy days withheld reflections, giving back the crests of waves, their foam and spray, and nothing more. For the mirrors, chiseled and polished by hands, were flat, so the humans whirled before the glass in search of the third dimension. For children's eyes were curved like the earth the sun lit daily. For children cried as light pierced their eyes, and what the humans heard was need. It was not theirs, it was theirs. It was the truest reflection they could almost see. A cord to bind us. Was it not then, as I saw the future embodied in the body of my child, I sought a story to tether us together, my daughter, myself, a story too to tie the mother me to the one I was before I birthed her. The cord had been severed. Then I heard a woman ask, is that white baby yours? As if all I was was not white, as if all my daughter was, was white, as if I were a brown wet nurse feeding the baby the only white drops of me. The next poem is um, my daughter's favorite poem of the book. She's eight years old now and loves um, learning about this time in her life when she was first discovering language. Small green bowl. At 18 months, my daughter says, do you want more? When she wants more grapes, more blueberries, more cubes of cheese to fill her small green plastic bowl. Do you want to get up? Do you want to go out? Do you want to listen to that song again? These are the questions I ask her, which she repeats. No I comes to fill the small green plastic bowl. Mama speaks of herself as mama, and mama's child is always you. As you learn to search yourself for the small green plastic bowl, I find an I, as do you. We fill the bowl together with cold berries. So um, as Becky said, um, that when I turned this, when I submitted this manuscript to Perugia, um, it did not have my father's death in it. it. His death actually happened one day after I declared my manuscript to be complete, which was a, a, yes, a strange coincidence. There was like a very small part of me that felt like, oh no, did I cause it? for having like finished this book uh, that, that had him as such a major character. Um, but as I, um, I, you know, as I was sitting with this manuscript, it felt like, do I edit, you know, do I edit the death in? 
And um, I, I definitely couldn't when it was like so, so close to it, but there were there, the next two poems I actually wrote um, this past summer and was really happy that they were able to make their way into the book. Um, <clears throat> the first one is called Order of Operations. You try to follow your father's dictum, stay ahead, cover next week's chapter in algebra now, so when the teacher delivers the lesson in the future, the future will be a memory for you, the word problem you've already solved. A family travels in a train at a velocity X miles per hour greater than a car. From inside the train, the car seems to slip slowly backward like salmon swimming against the current to spawn. But you are not chasing time to make life. As you speed through the weeks to the destination, you try to quantify the benefit of an earlier arrival. You need to know why in the textbook of your life, the order of operations insists that you cry for your father before he dies. So when he dies, you are prepared. You'll live in the memory of pain, which is not pain. It's a family moving forward on a train. Alighting. From a distance, I spot roadkill in my lane. As I approach, it moves. A gray wing rises, lowers, a sparrow trying to fly. I swerve and look back, see the wind flap a wing, the bird still dead, its feathers combed by air. In a poem, when a dead thing moves, I switch lanes too. My father lands on a thought, like a blackbird on a power line, its talons sharp. I am busy. I am writing a poem about a bird on a road. I drop down to the next line. And this is the last poem I'll read this evening. Self-portrait as a clothesline. My life was stretched between two sweet gum trees. Moments hung from me, the one's memory kept, pinched between clothespins, flapping. A clean wet sock, a first love, black with a yellow stripe across the toes. A blouse the wind sent wrapping around the line a loss that hid from me my life for some time. Some pins held up nothing, a dream of a future, whole days I missed as a gust lifts a sheet onto someone's lawn. Once sharp talons gripped the line, a sparrow perching. Its head twitched left and right as though it didn't intend its life. Then the sparrow lifting off, plucked the cord, made it ripple, made clothes swing. And there I was, again, between the trees. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Beautiful, Carolina. Thank you so much. I'm going to bring us into gallery view before I forget. So um, hopefully someone can tell me in the in the chat, whether you can see all of us now. Um, that, is, that is my intention for attendees to be able to see our gallery. Um, beautiful, beautiful reading. I feel like that line from, um, uh, let's see, I'm gonna try one more time. <laughs> um, the line from memory halved, we are always making doubles. Um, that is, I, so many lines have resonated with me tonight that make me think of what we are all doing as as poets um, and with memory and time. Um, so that was beautiful. I, I want to hear a little bit of conversation. Um, we don't have a lot of time together, but, um, and I don't see any questions in the chat, but please feel free to pop one in there if you have one. 
Um, and I want to start by by um, asking about the cover of the book, um, this beautiful book, because um, I wondered, Carolina, if you would share with us a little bit of the back, like the secret story of the cover and the, the backstory and how this came to be, because it's so beautiful. And I know the story, but I think everyone would like to to hear where the, the provenance of the cover. Yeah, so my um, my sister-in-law, Elizabeth Munger, um, was the one who um, who created the cover. I told her that I, um, I showed her um, one of my poems, um, Law of Conservation of Mass and Energy. And I said, you know, I really wanted there to be, you know, a, like a woman um, nursing, a baby nursing. And, um, you know, if there was some way to have uh, text be sort of superimposed on, on her body. And, um, and so anyway, this is what Elizabeth created. Um, this was her own interpretation of the, of that poem. Um, she looked into the markings that um, certain insects make um, when they travel through the books. And she looked at the, the markings of the death watch beetle and she kind of splattered the paint onto this collage um, so that it it looked like um, the the way the way that certain books are are hollowed out um, and yeah and the and the text superimposed um, on the on the woman is you know Proust um, you have you know all this um, all of this like amazing poetic text on on memory and it's and what's really uh, fascinating is that um, well she had chosen a different text to be superimposed on the woman and child, and then I, I was like no I, I didn't want that so I, so we put Proust on instead and because um, it was medical text and, and anyway I, I I thought this was more poetic and what was a really happy accident and I, I couldn't believe this happened um, was that when we superimposed text onto the baby it actually says a child in the sunset falling asleep and that's like right next to this this yellow um uh, on around the baby's head and that just felt like you know it was just meant to be <laughs> so yeah <laughs> it was a really wonderful experience and then and then becky and is it jeff is that his name yes okay um who who designed the cover around it i loved how the the yellow kind of like goes around the back Yes, shout out to Jeff Potter, our book designer, um, and who I get to work with, and also each poet gets to work with really intimately. Um, so, poets, do, did any do any of you have a question for um, another poet in the room, or did something come up that you are is a burning question that you want to ask? Please jump in if so. I wanted well, to ask yeah, go uh, ahead. Jennifer about coming many years later to writing about dance. So many of us have our careers either before poetry or simultaneously with poetry and yet don't write about it. And I'm one of those. And so I'm just interested in how it suddenly came to you that it was time. And now you said you've been writing in a rush about that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I think it was a gate that just needed to be like cranked open. And then once it did, it just came forward. But I do think that earlier selves kind of, I don't know, they superimpose themselves in this kind of imprinted way on who we are. And we almost forget, like, I never saw it as this other thing, like a topic. It just felt like this absorbed part of me. And I think I didn't have that like distance. It was just too meshed with me. Um, and once I kind of cranked it open as a topic, um, I don't know, this aesthetic distance like almost hap happened almost immediately. And then it became this thing that I could look at in a, in a completely different way and realize that um, it had been with me all along and it, it was sort of layering um, so many things. So 
I guess the work I'm I'm writing it in like an act one sort of thing before having kids and then I'm doing an act two where I'm realizing that so many of the dance aspects of my life are like embedded or enmeshed in the experience of raising kids um, but in a much more like organic way so uh, it, it's just been very eye-opening to to bring all that up to the surface and I guess just to know that we have I think a lot of these um sunk part of ourselves that that once they rise up have so much to teach us that that in and of itself has been really gratifying so we'll coin that phrase aesthetic distance because people are going to be using that so i wrote it <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you lynn i have a question for carolina um as evidenced in me taking me like 30 years to start writing about dance um you know you had an experience obviously with your father and then almost like in the same breath writing a poem about uh, that addresses you know his his passing and i wondered um how you were able to or what it was like to write so quickly in the moment of i don't know i feel like i i, I need a long time to digest something and so um i'm amazed that you were able to write into the experience kind of as it was happening and I don't know what, what my question is, but I guess I wonder if you could speak about that or tell us about that, what that was like for you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I it, it's funny that you say that because it felt like time, like a lot, like a lot of time went by. Because like if it, when um, when my father passed away in October, like November, January, you know, November, December, January, I was not able to write about it. Um, uh, or not able to write well about it. Um, but I think that the in order of operations, there had been an idea that had been brewing for a long time, um, just about the sense that I always have of like preparing for disaster, preparing for loss. Um, I feel that it's, you know, I think it's very like ingrained in me. Um, I even considered calling it immigrant story instead of operation, the order of operations, like as a the kind of immigrant way of always like like try to try to be ahead of of whatever is around you, but that the way that that being ahead can feel lonely, um, and so um, I think it's just the fact that that I'd been thinking about that for a long time, and then suddenly um, it sort of found uh, it found a voice. Um, in in grief um so maybe that's why i was i was able to so um, this is a little bit related there's a one question in, in the chat in the q a um how did your ideas and feelings around memory evolve as you worked through the book Um, I think that in the beginning, um, I was, I was sort of fixated on particular memories being lost, you know, I think in the, in the first section of the book, um, the poem, like a little water or the spires, um, it's, uh, you know, my dad forgetting that I studied abroad in England and that being really shocking to me because you know, with um, the sort of India's like colonial history, like we know England, we remember England. <laughs> um, and so, um, it, yeah, initially it was about the mourning, the loss of like particular memories. And I think that um, by the third section in the book and by my later poems, it's not so much about particular memories, but more about like what is what what are we exactly like what are we as human beings you know the poem like archipelago um is is trying to sort of theorize like what a self even is if 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 you are so porous you know if if you are able to like um you know have memory sort of fall out of you like this then you know then what does it even mean to to think of a self as existing, you know, um, is it that are, are we just many, many different people throughout the course of our lives? And so I think that that um, that's one thing that changed as I was writing. It felt it felt like it became much more general, a sort of preoccupation of uh, you know who we who we even are 
do we even possess what does it even mean to have a memory like i started thinking about that like you know do you have the memory only in the moment that you are uh reminiscing <laughs> do you uh you know if you're just sort of living your life and you haven't thought about your past for a long time like do you have it <laughs> you know uh i, I don't know I, it's it's very um it was very interesting to i think think of think of these things that i hadn't thought before my father started to lose his well i will i will bring us to a close because it's nine and i i want to be mindful of of time um mm -hmm this is a book that wrestles with so many big questions. It's really a philosophical um, uh, dive into, um, into these questions. And so I encourage you to, to spend more time with this book. I'm so happy that you brought up several different poems, like, oh, this is like, you, you referred to other poems that you didn't read. Um, mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a very rich and textured, um, journey of a book I would say so there's so much more to explore and enjoy um, when you get your hands on it and I know many many people in in the room already already have their hands on it um, so I want to encourage you to look into this book and the books of all of our readers um, from tonight thank you to each of you readers um, Jennifer and Lynn and Catherine for joining and making this night so beautiful and Carolina congratulations um, on the birth of your book and we welcome it to the world. Um, Beverly, thank you for being here to help um, make this evening happen. And everyone, you can un unmute and um, we'll say goodbye that way so we can be sort of in, in the space um, em embodied a little bit more. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Congratulations, Bye. Carolina. Congratulations, Carolina. Carolina. I loved your reading. It was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank everyone for coming. With all the thank the thank yous. <laughs>